Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, water is setting up. I'm going to give you an introduction. Uh, our following speakers are uh, Nikita Mazarov and Kenneth Brown, uh, two brilliant in individuals in IT, the IT industry. Nikita Mazarov, PhD, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Living Archives Art Project in Montemore University, Sweden, focusing on privacy issues and revolving around data archival. Kenneth Brown is a CISSP and is a federal project manager at VMware, specializing in automation and operations management. Please join me with me in a Excuse me, guys. I had to work steps. <laughs> Please join me in uh, introducing the team. Here are our guests. I don't think you got to be worried about anybody messing with you. Uh, no, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> image counter surveillance strategies and all the things that entails. Sure, and to kind of preface what he said a while ago about project management, I do PM now. I'm not sure why I did that. I still want to go back to hands on keys someday. I used to do senior consultant for VMware for three years, and then I decided it was a good idea to complain and move on. So that's kind of my space. I work for the Department of VA, so I manage an account with them now with five different residents, and I've been there for three years and a year of deal. So that's what brings us to here today. So why talk about image security? I know that's probably why everybody came in here. So it's an important thing, and images are getting much more proliferant in the you know, economy today with everybody. So, and for example, in 2010, there was 1 million different images on uh, Instagram, and now there's 500 million in 2016. I think we've jumped up maybe another 200 million just since 2014. So images are big. Many people are Reddit fans out here. It used to be a lot of text, and now it seems to be all pictures. So, you know, it's kind of a, a good example of how it's everywhere. So. Coupled with the increasing image data mining capabilities, another tool called uh, Fate Find Fate. Excuse me. It's kind of interesting one that you can take a picture and you can take it and find somebody with almost 70% accuracy. So there's a lot of tools that we'll talk about here that you might have heard or might not, and you can go back and look for them. And uh, all that means is there's greater vigilance to do when developing and deploying image handling strategies. <coughs> So what we talked about today is kind of the myriad ways that images can be mined for actionable intelligence, and some of the ways may not be obvious to you immediately. And that's kind of the point of this talk, is not so much belong to the technical backdrop of the image, the metadata, and so on, which we'll be looking at, but more looking at things which are just pictures within pictures that we might not think matter, but that will ultimately show matter actually quite a lot. And then once we kind of show the risks of images, we'll be talking about the counter-forensic strategies or the counter-surveillance strategies that you can use to then minimize security leaks from visual data. And specifically, we're going to focus on three things when we talk about counter-forensics. So we're going to focus on alteration, obfuscation, and redaction. And what each of those things means, how to do it safely, how to do it without leaking data. So it's not as simple as simply deleting sensitive information. There are particular protocols and procedures that we should follow, best practices, as it were. So here's a preliminary case analysis. Uh, there's a URL here. If anybody has a device, I think you want to If anyone can't read that, that's tinyurl.com slash besides ing1. So this is kind of a personal example. Ironically enough, the picture that I ended up sending to Nikita maybe a year or so ago. And uh, something that I, you know, and obviously just took and didn't think much of. So the point of this is to take a look at it. If you have a device, pull it up and look at it. And then just kind of take a minute to note all the different information that you could possibly glean from this picture and, you know, what you see. And then we'll circle back for the end of the presentation and let you guys, you know, revisit. So don't call anything out now, but just take some notes of what you think and see, and then see how that changes as the presentation moves forward. Yeah, so just take a few minutes to, or a few moments and just take this in. Okay. And you can download the raw image as well. Can you read the link again? Yeah, tinyurl.com. 
slash B sides IMG one. Say that would lead you to another longer URL. Hopefully when I get the perspective on images is good. So you said for now I just can't take it in. The screen is a little small, but the raw image is a bit larger. You know, just think about what's wrong with this picture, right? So we'll play the classic children's game, right? You look at it, what doesn't make sense here? In other words, what could compromise the security? If you want to keep private the identity of, let's say, the subject in the photograph, what is wrong with this photo? Oh, no, 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 Yes. This is an example of some hardware that I just bought. Mm -hmm. So there should be, if you're thinking about how many things you should be able to extract from this photo, there's no exact figure, but aim for at least a dozen actionable items. Okay, so you have to make a checklist of 12 things. And let's see if you can find them at the end. We'll circle back to this. I'll use it see what you guys found. Close the box. You can pull it up and look at it go out and come back. Great. So this is basically what we're going to go over today, a broad technology of privacy concerns. There's going to be basically six action points. The first three, we'll be talking about the actual data leak. So we'll start talking about photo metadata. We'll go over the nitty-gritty of what that means, different patterns that form different actionable intelligence that we can extract from it. Then from that, we'll move on to talking about what we're calling secondary location leaks, or environmental variables in the photo that can, again, betray the anonymity of the source or the way information that you don't want really. Then we'll finally start talking about the safe redaction protocol that we've talked about, where we have altering things, modifying them, and so on. And then after this first segment, the next three components are, whereas first of all, we'll talk about the image privacy concerns, then we'll talk about the dangers of image discovery, where seemingly innocuous images can be escalated to gain access to private images. And here we'll talk about three variables. We'll talk about fusking, you know, what that means, how to, how to perform basic fusking attacks. We'll talk about CDIR, or content-based image retrieval. And then finally, we're going to touch on social media mining, and then Loop back around and how all of this fits together. Hey, so the first section that we'll be talking about in regards to image privacy is the metadata. Okay, images are loaded with metadata. For our purposes, metadata very simply means data about data. It is usually information about the image that is not immediately viewable when you just view the image. Okay, this is a few more very basic things that we'll go over in a second, but the most common format for image metadata is known as EXIF or the exchangeable image file format. This is one of the most popular of metadata formats for consumer images that you, that you take on your camera, but it's not the only format. There's also, for instance, the IPTC, which the press uses, which journalists use to add keyword tagging and bylines and so on into the photos. So EXIF is the main format, but it's not the only format, but since it is the main consumer format, it's what we'll be focusing on today. <clears throat> so we talked about this metadata thing, this data about data. How do we actually view this data? Uh, there are a variety of exit viewers or just general metadata viewers which can easily extract the information for us. Uh, the key figure, the standalone tool for this is known as exit tool. We'll go over its basic operation in a little bit of depth in a second. And then there's also, for instance, browser plugins like Exit Viewer, which you can load in Firefox and view an image that way. So here we have uh, a sample photo file. Again, another sample. Not This is not the first image I've used, but a different image. And the uh, address <coughs> is tinyurl.com slash bsize img2. Yeah, what we'll do right now, and you guys can follow along if you're preloading this, is show you what metadata is waiting in this photo. Yeah, so right now we'll walk you through how to open it in Executor and Firefox, which is a, again, an add-on for the browser that's very easy uh, to use. It has a nice GUI, and then we'll walk you through how to open it so you just install the add-on. Go to Tools, Exit Viewer, and then you can select a local file or a remote URL and load it in. And then, so that's Exit Viewer. 
I'm going to exit tool is a little more powerful in that while exit viewer, as the name implies, is just the viewer, exit tool is also a comprehensive editor, and this will become important to us in a second. Uh, exit tool is primarily a uh, command line utility, even though there's uh, graphical <coughs> interfaces available for it, but in the command line, you load it very simply, exit tool, then the name of the file, and here on the screen you see a sample of readout of data that it spits out, and we'll parse this in a second of what this all means and what particular uh, segments to focus on. Does that one also let you change data? Yeah, exactly, and we'll get to that. Sorry. So exit tool, it's like I said, it's a very powerful program, whereas exit viewer just lets you do things. Exit tool actually lets you start getting dirty into it and messing around with it, changing it, deleting it, all that good stuff. But before we get to that, so what information can this metadata reveal from photographs? So once you open uh, a random photo that you took in an exit view or exit view, you'll see a lot of technical minutia that, you know, photo buzz, obsess over, like focal length, brightness, aperture, all those factors. For us, they're not that important. Instead, we focus on usually marginalized parameters that are sometimes overlooked. And here's just an index we'll go over through each one of these in depth. We'll look at the camera make, the model, bit, basically the information that your camera leaks about itself. Then we'll look at information the camera leaks about your location. And this comes into two factors, both in terms of the time and the time zone, and of course the GPS coordinates. Then after that, so looking at the information the camera leaks about itself, the information the camera leaks about the location it was taken in, then we'll look at the information the camera leaks specifically about you. And then finally, we'll also look at thumbnails, and we'll get to that. So let's start with camera data. So, in the metadata, it is not uncommon to find the make, in other words, the brand of the camera, and in turn, this can link the photographer's camera to a photograph, right? Let's say if you took a picture with an icon, and the metadata says that this photo was taken with an icon, that right away presents a linking chain, right? Where the camera that you took a photo with matches the brand of the metadata, right? In and of itself, that doesn't mean much, right? Millions of people have Nikon's camera, Nikon cameras, but when it's coupled with all the other parameters, that chain can become stronger and links can become tighter. So we start off with a very general data, right? The brand. The information can be more specific by then saying the specific model of a given brand, right? That already narrows the playing field down of who has a specific model of a given brand. We can narrow that down even further if the actual serial number is embedded in the metadata, as well as indeed some models do add the serial number. And this finally, we start off with the most general factor, right, the brand, move it down to narrow the specific model of the brand, to finally the specific camera, right, by the serial number. And that finally links the camera to a particular person. So serial numbers bear special consideration in metadata because Let's say that the photo that you're analyzing does contain a serial number. Right away, this opens up a number of venues for an attacker or an adversary to start asking. The first question that they would ask is, if the metadata contains a serial number, was a product registration form ever filled out upon the purchase of the device? Right? We all get those when we get a new box. It has a postcard to send in or file online where you want to register your camera. Don't. <laughs> and so that's a very simple, direct takeaway, is don't. Because that means that your name is now tied to your serial number, sitting in a corporate database somewhere in that, you don't know how they're storing it. Right? You don't know what data security practices they're practicing. If their database is leaked, then suddenly that information is public, right? That you own this particular camera or this particular serial number. And when that can lead another adversary to be a third party is that start injecting your serial numbers into photos that they took to frame you for the particular photo, right? So the takeaway from this is do not register your camera. Another way, however, that the information can be found, you know, found is another question that an attacker would ask is, okay, if the camera wasn't registered, was the number ever filed on an insurance inventory or an asset list? Right? Because you have insurance may specifically file include the serial number on the actual form. Right? If that number is available, then an adversary may potentially gain access to it. And state actors, such as local law enforcement, have easier access than non-state actors, but not necessarily, right? Because remember, you don't know the data and the policies of the third party, right? So that is always a risk when you share a serial number. And finally, the third question that they may ask is, 
Are there any other photos online which have that same serial? If the yes, then do any of those other photos or websites in which they're hosted reveal any actionable intelligence? In other words, any information that we can use about the photographer. Okay? And there are websites out there such as Camera Trace or Stolen Camera Finder where you can enter a serial number and it automatically performs an open source intelligence to look up of sites like Flickr, which check if the serial number is viewable and it automatically returns all links it finds to images that have the same serial number as viewers. Okay? And if these sites stop working, you could always simply do a Google search for its serial number. Right? Plug your camera's serial number into Google and see what it finds. Or you might find an old Flickr account that you forgot you had, for instance. Okay, so the takeaway from this is that serial numbers are dangerous. You need to be careful about how you share them. Moving on to the next period, remember first we talked about the information that the camera reveals about itself, right? The make, the model, the serial. Now we'll talk about the information the camera reveals about your location. The first thing that the metadata usually leaks is the date and the time. Okay? The date and the time can be plural. In other words, there's not a singular date and a time in a camera's metadata. There's usually a plurality of different dates and times. This can be the date the photo was taken, the date the photo was modified, the date the GPS coordinates were recorded, and so on and so forth. In other words, if you're reading through your metadata in a photo and you find one timestamp and you remove it and you think you're safe, you're not. There's usually at least three different timestamps embedded in metadata and oftentimes more. So let's say that a photo is either known or suspected to be taken at a given location. We can retroactively use CCTV footage to then review to find the corresponding actor who is at that point in time. Right? So let's say you take a photo of a poster that you put up. Okay? You put that photo online. You have the GPS coordinates of where exactly you are standing, plus or minus a few feet. Someone else can later pull CCTV, like a state actor can pull CCTV footage and, find, and then record who exactly was standing at that point in time who took that photo. Right? So in other words, the date and time are dangerous because they, like all the other factors, can be coupled together to escalate the potential uh, risk. And finally, the time zone can of course narrow down the location for which the photo was taken, which again can be corroborated with corresponding GPS data if it's available. So kind of one of the running themes throughout our whole talk is that these factors can never be taken in isolation, right? They're always interrelated with all the other variables. Okay? So you can never look at a date in and of itself. A date always signifies something else, right? Time always signifies space or spatial presence. And so that's one of the important here is even though you know, I'm going through these things one by one, they're always correlated and interrelated. And this finally brings us to GPS data. So the global positioning <coughs> system, it's accurate roughly within 3 to 10 meters, or about 10 to 33 feet. But these numbers that are public are based on a study that was done in 2009 of iPhone locations. We can see that this is much more accurate now, eight years later. And the GPS data, even if we just assume it's you know, 3 to 10 meters, that's still accurate enough to what building or the immediate vicinity that someone is in. So the question is, how accurate is GPS data? Accurate enough to worry about. So the next thing is that, we said the third thing, remember that the camera leaks is information about itself, about the camera, information about the location, and finally information about you. Some modern cameras, when you first boot them up, they ask you to type your name in so they can personalize it, right? So you guys have seen that, where then every time you boot the camera up, you can say, hey, you're here. Again, just if you do not register a camera, do not input your actual name into the camera. If it prompts you to do setup, the reason why not is because if you do what the camera, and again, this varies by make and model, but as a general rule of thumb, what the camera then does is it embeds the owner's name into a field in the metadata, which literally says owner's name, and then the name you entered upon registration. Okay? So again, the simple takeaway from this is don't do it. Do not enter your name if the camera asks you to. And the basic corollary of this is similarly so don't assign identifying names to SD cards that you plug in or to folders or directories because again these can be potentially compromised through the information. And then the last component of metadata that we need to worry about is thumbnail data. Up to now we have been talking exclusively about textual metadata, right? Metadata is just text, as GPS coordinates, as serial numbers, and model numbers, 
brand names and some, but metadata is not restricted to textual information. It can include binary information. In this case, it can include other images, specifically include the original unmodified thumbnail image. So let's say that you take a photo, you notice that there's some stuff on the sides you don't want in the photo, so you crop it out. You open up Photoshop, you crop it out, you save it, and you think you're fine. Fun fact, Photoshop by default saves the original unmodified photo as a thumbnail. In fact, PDF documents do the same thing. Let's say you scan a document into Acrobat, you redact what you think are the sensitive parts in the footer, you save the PDF and think you're good to go. No, PDFs embed the original unmodified scanned image as a thumbnail view. So you would need to delete that specifically. So in other words, metadata is not just text. It can also be binary data or specific images. And is the thumbnail actually included into the uh, overall modified file? Yes. So it's, it's not its own separate thing. No, but then no, that's the thing. It's the thumbnail. Like I said, the metadata is data that exists within the file, right? Usually in the header or in the footer. Well, doesn't the that kind of defeat the purpose of doing the redaction? Anyway? Exactly, unless you can, of course, remove Sorry, I don't mean to answer a question when you're in the middle of it, but... No, but it does, unless you can remove it, right? Which we might potentially... And you'll get to later. Ways of removing and cleaning and... Great, great. Well, you also have trouble with this. Oops, Mark and Carmen wrote something, and it got the public. They had redacted it, and people were able to keep the data. They blacked out. Yes. And we'll get specifically to that too. This, there's just the issues that you bring up about redacting so called using blackout boxes that present a very specified risk. They'll eventually become apparent. But for now, the takeaway from this is that yes, the thumbnails are embedded directly into the image, they're not separate. But on top of that, if you use Windows, you then also have to worry not only about the embedded thumbnails, but about separate thumbnails as well. Because Windows embeds a file in the directory, this is now a separate file called thumbs.db, which has, again, thumbnail images of all the images in that folder. And it's a hidden system file that you won't see unless you have that enabled. So kind of, if you're using Windows, you already have the native metadata to worry about, and then you also have the operating system layer to worry about as well. So you have to twice remove it, and there's instructions for that widely available. Okay, so we've talked about all this metadata, all this bad stuff that's hidden in there. Finally, how do we remove it? Well, the good news is that that is actually very, very easy. Okay, we can do it with a single exit tool command. You see it up there, exit tool, the name of the file, or alternatively, the path, or the directory. Then the command overwrite original, what this says is it removes the original file that has the metadata in it. If you're just playing around with it, you might want to exclude that because otherwise you would lose your original file, but when you're actually doing serious work that you're ready to file monitor somewhere, you always want to include overwrite original so that you remove the original file that has the metadata so that you don't accidentally upload the wrong file, right? Because that would undermine your entire process. Okay, and then finally we get to this last operator, uh, dash all equals sign blank. What this does is that it replaces all metadata fields in the photo with blank space. In other words, this is another way of saying that it deletes them all. So in order to delete metadata from a file, you simply run this command, or you could, again, if you're running Windows, you could create a shortcut that automatically does it, and you can just drag folders onto it every single time before, yeah, before you upload them. Actually, sorry, I lied. I said that it was very easy to remove metadata with a single command. Uh, actually, it could get very hard. There's some metadata which we can term persistent. This is metadata that, a class of metadata which is resistant to deletion. Okay? For instance, to take an example, exit tool it has no trouble handling usually photo JPEGs. If you toss a photo at it that you took with your camera, it will usually do a very good job of scrubbing it. But let's say that you have a PNG, a portable network graphics file. And this PNG has footer chunks, known as text chunks, which is iText, text, or ztext. If you try to delete this, if you run this command on a PNG that has footer text chunks, it will not delete them, and it will not tell you that it did not delete them, because it does not natively recognize them. Okay? So in other words, it may not actually be that easy, and therefore you should never rely on simply exit tool. Can you explain really quick what a text chunk is? A text chunk in a PNG is very simply what the name implies. It is a chunk of the file, usually in the footer, which has textual data. Okay. 
for instance, you know, these four, uh, give an example of how you may encounter this, is remember I said at the beginning that, um, that there are different metadata formats, right? The one that we're talking about today, EXA, and then there's another one called IPTC, which journalists usually use. The way that IPTC allows you to insert keywords or bylines into an image is by adding a text chunk. Okay, so that's one example of where you can see a text chunk in a while, is if you go to a news site, BBC or whatever, and you save one of their images, and then you try opening them in a hex editor, you may see the, the very bottom of the file, a field that says Z text, and it would have keywords about it. And that's an example of a text chunk. Okay. So in other words, the takeaway from this is do not rely on one tool to do the job. After you scrub your photos with exit tool, open them up in a hex editor. No, there's any number of free hex editor, hex edit is a popular and so on. And then scan through particularly the header and the footer, but not exclusively, to see if there's any residual data, and then you can conduct manual deletion by just overwriting it in hex if necessary. <clears throat> so we've talked about the different kinds of metadata, we've talked about how to delete metadata, and how to kind of back up a bit to talk about the general mindset that you should employ. Okay? Your general kind of approach to images should be to delete data by default. Okay? In other words, the default operations protocol within the procedure should be delete all metadata unless you have a good reason to keep it. Your approach should not be keep all metadata unless you have a good reason to delete it. Okay? So let's say you have a stack of 10 photos. And on one photo, you say, no, I don't want my GPS coordinates going in this photo, so I'm going to delete them from this, but then I'm not going to touch the other nine photos. That is the absolutely wrong approach that you can take. Okay? The reason is because from those nine seemingly innocuous photos, you can glean enough information to identify that tenth photo that you wanted to decrypt. So let's consider a very kind of nailed down, simple, stripped down example. Let's say you're on vacation. You're walking down the street and you shoot three photos. You take a photo A as you're leaving your hotel room, a photo B in the middle of the street, and then photo C by the end of it. You don't care about images A and C, about the first and third image that you took, because they're whatever. They're a photo of your hotel and then a photo of a park. You might care about the C because let's say it's a store that you might not actually want people to know where it is because it deals in controversial goods or what have you. So you leave A and C intact, but you like the data from B, that controversial image. If someone can then find images A and B, and let's say A and B have a timestamp and GPS coordinates, and you can plan that they're in a straight line, then it will not take a lot to deduce where precisely B is based on the time of A and C. And then the more images you have, the more you can initially triangulate or form triangulation to find the image. So in other words, your approach should be, don't just delete information from images that you know you need to delete them from. Delete them from everything by default, unless there's a good reason to keep them. Okay? So, yes? When you do image conversions, like to different formats, does it carry all that information? That's a good question. It depends. Basically, you cannot rely on that. Sometimes it does. It depends on which program you use. It depends on the metadata standard that's being used. There's lots of variables to the fact where you cannot just say, yes, it doesn't think you're safe. It, it might, but you should always open them up after each conversion in a text editor and in a metadata viewer to check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the metadata is almost like a firewall approach, white whitelist approach. Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't allow anything, make the exceptions, no. Exactly. So we've talked about the kinds of metadata that's available, the kinds of metadata that we can delete, but what about modifying, right? Some things we might benefit us for instead of outright deleting data, we can change it to something. Luckily, again, in Exit Tool, we can easily, relatively easily, change values as long as we know the specific tag name. And sometimes the issue here is that tag names may not be <coughs> intuitive to us. Okay. And for this, luckily, Exit Tool has a list of, a very comprehensive list of tag names to use. So let's take a case study of modifying the metadata where if any of you guys opened that second image that we had, you may have noticed that the GPS coordinates were in. Manisa, Turkey. Let's see if we can swap them over to Tampa. So the first step is we need a set of actionable coordinates that we can replace existing coordinates with. Okay. Let's turn to our friend Google. And yeah, we put in the location, we can click, and I'll show you guys a visual of this after I'm done or anything about it, where we can click on what's here, find the decimal degree coordinates, and then get the degree minute and seconds, right? Because we need for metadata to 
work in EXA, we need it in the degree format, not in the decimal format. And of course, we can avoid using Google if we prefer for privacy reasons that might be preferable. We can use OpenStreetMap, but this will be a little bit clumpier because OpenStreetMap, we need to use a third party decimal to degree conversion, but it's still entirely doable and maybe preferable. So here's just a visual of what I was talking about earlier, where we find a location that we want, we right click, go to what's here, then we find the coordinates on the bottom. We click those and get the coordinates on the top left to again translate from decimal to degree format. Okay, we need to keep coordinates when we inject them into exit based mandate, we need to keep them in degree format. And then here's a simple command that we run in exit tool. So we have our image, this is our sample image too. We have the GPS latitude position. Again, don't forget both the quotation marks, the start and end of the coordinates and within the coordinates. Then we have the longitude, then we have the longitude reference point, whether it's west or east, and then again we have our overwrite original. And what this does, you guys can try it yourself if you're playing along, is swaps the GPS coordinates of that sample set image from Turkey to incidentally where we are today. And again, remember what I said earlier when we were talking about date and timestamps, right, is that metadata has multiple layers of timestamps. And GPS coordinates, depending on the model of the camera, can oftentimes have their own timestamps. So what you need to do is again look at the specific tag names for GPS and see if you need to inject the timestamp for the GPS in this command as well. And then finally, a quick note on exit tool is it can be a little finicky and respond to this weird error message that says make or no offsets may be incorrect, fix certain one. When we see this, we can try to fix it by appending dash f to our command, or ignore it with dash m. And one thing to keep in mind, that's the tools that the commands are case sensitive, so when we have an uppercase f and a lowercase m, we keep the cases same. But now again, modification is not as easy as I again said, because we need to be careful to do it correctly if we want to do it effectively. Okay, in other words, we need to avoid when doing counter forensic work, we need to anticipate future forensic analysis and make sure that the forensic analysis can not only detect the original image, but then cannot detect tamper. Okay? Because that's one of the key elements of doing counter effective counter forensics is not just making sure the data is not recoverable, but the very fact that the data has been modified is not perceptible. Okay? And that means that we need to be careful. And this brings us back to this major notes of error. Okay. Maker notes are manufacturer specific metadata tags. In other words, there are tags that a Nikon might have, but that an Olympus won't have. Okay. And the, again, this brings us to uh, yet another tag list. This is like the third tag list that you're playing along, where there's a nice explanatory list of the different maker notes. In other words, the tags that different manufacturers take. And this is significant because we need to assume adversarial familiarity with maker notes. For instance, here I have uh, an internal newsletter for our law enforcement officials from, I think, 2007, where they explicitly say that forensic analysts should be cognizant of maker notes not matching. Okay? That in turn means that when we're doing counter-forensic work, we need to be cognizant of the fact that forensic analysts are cognizant of the fact that we might spoof maker notes, and we need to make sure that the spoofing is done accurately. That's why oftentimes it's easier to simply delete instead of modify. Okay, that's enough of metadata stuff now. We also only have seven minutes left, so I might kind of skip through we can run over some of these kind of quick, so we can get to the end so you guys can review the picture again. So, moving on past metadata, the secondary stuff that you need to look for is uh, location leakage and related environmental visual type leaks. So, you know, you always need to be cognizant of all the matters in which visual clues might be inadvertently compromised situations. situation. So, for example, if you think back to the picture that we had, there's a lot of different things that you can take from a photo that you might just happen to look at on Facebook or whatever, but you can dig further into it. So brand names, they can be region specific, they can be, you know, state specific. If it's Cigar City Brewery, you know, it's probably here in Tampa somewhere or something to that information. Native flora and fauna, you know, you're not going to see a palm tree in Iceland. So you can kind of narrow down the different areas where things might be. Textual data. So for instance, if you see a newspaper up there, if you see, you know, a date and time, you can use that. But you can also use it to your advantage, too. So if you want to have somebody confused a little bit, take a turkey newspaper and lay it on your coffee table when you take a picture or something. Light switches. You might think of them as common here, but different countries have different standards. So like a single little flip switch might be different here from and wherever you are. So, you know, everything is regional is kind of what it comes down to. Electrical outlets is another one. Our 110 outlets are different than over in Sweden. 
excuse me, Sweden and other places. So something also to be cognizant of. And then, you know, identifiable locations. Say, for instance, you go down to Key West and you go to the big buoy down there, you're getting a picture. There's only one of those in the world, so people are going to know exactly where that is at the end of US 1. So, chain hotel rooms is another thing. People will take pictures in hotels, and as you can take pictures and go online and then search via hotel what their interiors look like and try to coordinate what that is to find a chain in. So, say it's a Hilton or a Hyatt or something. So, you can start to narrow down individual things, but then also pile it all together. So, you find a Hilton with a, you know, a Brand logo and blah 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 blah. From PII. Yes. So just yeah. identifiable yes. information. Yes. So there's a lot of beautiful things about it. And the reason we just do the II, not the PII, is because we we're focusing on the environment. It doesn't have to be personal. No, exactly. It can be something as simple as the hotel <laughs> chain. Uh, Bed spread. Uh, yeah. Bed spread because they're like yeah. part of the brand. Yeah. Yeah, it's identifiable information, and if you, as, as minute as something may be, you tie enough of those together, and then you could go, this city, this hotel, this time, because the sun is at a certain thing coming through the window. I mean, you know. Google Maps to see the orientation east west for hotel windows. Well, for people that have a detective mind, you yes. can really yes. put those Hone things together. Yeah. Uh, go off of some of this. Here's some of just the outfit examples. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that you go to different countries, different outlets. So... You have to find some of these other places. So, for instance, just to give a quick example of where this might be useful is, let's say you're taking an emotional photo of your data center, and you want to disguise the location that the data center is in, but you can use swap out the outlet heads, right, to change them to, let's say, sensor, right? And that would make it appear if someone was closely analyzing your image and they saw an outlet in the corner, like, aha, I wonder where it is, they'd think, oh, it must be in Switzerland, right, whereas all you did is just swap the outlet head out. Good point. Uh, so some additional visual cues, aside from the different localisms that we talked about, be wary of any other VI type slippage thing. So reflections in mirrors, uh, exposed body parts, future imagination for that one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, height things, so if you're standing next to something or where the level of the camera picture was taken, and you can judge somebody's height based on how high they're holding the camera, things like that. Uh, location calculations, you know, depending on CCTV footages and everything else, you can put it all together and find out where this person might be standing away. And it all boils down to what it says at the bottom, extremity equals vulnerability, so just keep cognizant of big things. Can you guys speak to, I should know this, and I used to know it, but... Like some of the built-in features with not just Android, because we all, most of us take pictures with our cameras. I mean, our phones. Okay, and by default, most of them are JPEGs, aren't they? Not CNGs. Okay. Um, what are some of the built-in options to say, okay, do not put metadata in by default when taking pictures? I know <laughs> iPhone has some. Of those. I strip up the GPS on my phone, past that, I just rip it out on my computer when I copy it over. I wonder if there's any apps that can go through there. From. Probably not on iPhone. Not that thing down. Not jailbroken. Yeah, anywhere. What about it? I'm Android probably. I'm a big iOS person, so I would have to default for somebody else. I am just because of the security part. Functionality is different. Oh yeah, but there's too much crap that comes through the Google Store. Sorry. So we'll keep on kind of going through here. Another fun, another fun thing to play with is GeoGuessr. Anybody ever heard of it? A fun website if you have absolutely nothing better to do and time to kill. It'll pull up a random uh, picture, like a Google Maps picture. I think it's based on Google Maps, so you can try to identify where in the world it is. Show Dan. Show Dan. Okay, you heard of it. I'll tell you that. Okay, we'll hear about it. So anyway, it's scary. It'll scare the hell out. Great. So another kind of thing to worry about with Dan is seeing the dash. So let's see how a potentially sensitive component of an image, right? And you want to get rid of it, okay? And you might have the impulse to use a flashy, gimmicky, novelty filter that you have in Photoshop, like a blur, you know, whatever, fuzz, anything, right? Again, the key takeaway from this is don't. The reason is, let's say that you have a credit card, or let's say your ID that you put up, so you want to show it off, but you feel like you're being smart because you blurred out your employee number, okay? If someone can guess the font that's used on the ID card, which they probably can from text that has not been blurred out, they can then simply generate an A to Z 039 list of different characters right, that the font uses, and then go through and apply all the common blur filters that are available in Photoshop, and then compare the opacity and so on of every single square to then potentially deduce what the text was. Okay? <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then one more thing after that is that, again, 
Think about blur pokers. Can we use a swirl rotation? Right? The swirl can be undone, but just going around slowly, slowly until we get the image back. So the takeaway from this is do not use gimmicky filters for that. Use redaction boxes, which we'll get to in a second. But before that, what you need to remember is even secondary subjects and photos can be critical. Let's like, say you have a photo of a guy and a dog. And you don't want to see who the guy is, so you blur him out, but you leave the dog. Right? You can still perform image attacks against the dog to potentially de anonymize who the guy was. Okay? And it sounds funny, but it's true, just like you could do with the funny. second reverse image <laughs> <service> to <laughs> The guy can do the same thing to the dog. So the key takeaway here is think about secondary subjects in photographs who are not your primary subject, but who may be critical in protecting the identity of. The primary subject. Okay, and this brings us to redaction boxes. But the key principle here is over deletion is better than under deletion. Okay? In other words, you need to redact more than you think is necessary. One of the main reasons to do, to do this is to avoid what we call remainder information. This means that sender or the ascender remnants of a font. And this means that the lines that kind of go above or below the baseline. So the letter lower key G, for instance, right, that has a descender remnant, or if you blur it out, you can see on the side, but there's a little bit left on it. Okay? Similarly, you want to redact empty space so that you can foil word size attacks. Because again, if you know the font and you know the font size, you can guess with relatively good probability what potential words are blurred out in the boxes if the boxes match the word exactly. So you need to blur out or redact the white space as well, not just the actual word. So image busking, we can kind of run through this quickly. A lot of cameras, I know cameras have a way that they serialize pictures and things that you haven't generated. So key point to this is if you go, if somebody takes a picture and you see it, I am the underscore 001, you probably can guess for the rest of them and do like a brute force and go through a directory and try to find all the other photos that come sequentially after that. So if somebody just posts 001, there might be 001 through 0, whatever, 100. So you can find a lot of other photos. It's kind of brute forcing. That is called busking. Uh, common busking patterns, so you can see the image uh, naming prefixes here, IMG is a common one, DSC, which is digital still capture, a common one on a lot of photos, and even Nikon, some vendor specific ones, they have like the letter N to the end of DSC, so DSC N would be a Nikon picture. So you can kind of use that to figure out what camera was from, and then use the numbering sequence to move up from there. And it's not also necessarily, me, not necessarily limited to just numerical sequences. Like if you see somebody has a picture posted in a directory at like family vacation, you can probably get some other common dictionary terms that might come up to that. So like kids, family, beach, just a lot of simple group works and things. <clears throat> I'll tell you an example where you can use that. If you know the iOS version that somebody's phone is running on, Say it's old. I know it's vulnerable to that type of malware. So I'm going to send an email right, to this example. person yeah. and then compromise the phone. It's a lot of it. Just do picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another topic here, kind of one of the remaining ones, is CDIR, which is a glorified way of saying content based image retrieval. So, uh, a way that you can do it, I'll skip through reading all of this. I mean, you guys can read it. But say, for instance, you have a picture of a cat and you want to find out more of the picture of this cat. You don't really know much about it. You can go to Google, and there's a button that a lot of people overlook, and it's right next to the little search, but it's on the left-hand side, it's a little camera. So it switches to image searching mode. So then you can upload this picture. So right at the bottom, we upload the picture of the lovely cat, which is named mysterycat.jpg. Google will come back and magically give you a name because it gives you a best guess. As long as the best guess for the image, paranoid cat. And then it'll start to give you all the other images that are related to it. So not only can you find a name technically associated with the picture, but all the other ones that are linked to it. So kind of a neat tool that you can do, but you can also use this for crowdsourcing or I mean, any other picture that you want. So for instance, this ties into how you can do it for other security considerations. So you have a big photo and you want to find out something specific about it, you can chop out little areas. So some specific landmark would then upload it to Google and have Google reverse engineer find out what that might be and find a name and blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot more that you can do with Google than I yes. keep hearing about it and I haven't used it. Yes. So finally, kind of the third component of it was just sorry, the old brief on just social media lines. So once you find a social media account, once you discover that based on performing CDIR, right, you can then be utilize that for acquaintance mapping, right? So now you know not just who potentially took the photo, but who their friends are. And in fact, you might find who took the photo through their friends, right? If you perform a CDIR search and you find someone's Twitter feed, and they're not the person you're looking for, but in their friends list or in their followers, 
that person is there, and you eventually narrow it down. So the point is that social media mining can be used to build acquaintance maps to find out who is related to whom. And then you can escalate that to gain even greater privileges by seeing when someone, like you could find when someone posted a photo of celebrating my birthday today, and boom, you now know their birthday, right? Which you can use to potentially sort of secure password reset questions, right? And so on. So social media mining is a critical component. Okay, so now I'm going to double back. Remember this photo that we put up at the start? Hey, okay, guys, look at who wants to shout out random things that they can identify. Remember, I said that there's roughly about a dozen. So you guys can just shout them out. See your face in the uh, glasses. Good. Yeah, I got a blue camera. Good. So what, what more can you tell us about that? So good to see you can see I got a blue face. camera, I can tell you have glasses. Good. I think I can see some sunlight. Good. Serial so number. Serial so number. Nick card. Great, so good. So serial numbers. Good. You can see on the devices here, you can see the actual so if you zoom in, you can see the actual serial numbers, which is and sport contract. Sorry? Sport contract and manufacturer to Dell. Good. Good. Exactly. And then from there you can trace that. Oh, I take it down after we bear it. No, that's on the Okay, so what else? You can tell you you're running Windows 10, it looks like. Good. Yeah. You can if you zoom in on the screen, you can see the OS, right? And then target particular exploits based on the. I couldn't tell the time. I didn't see the time. Say North America because the outlet? Yes, good. The outlet in the background, right? It's North America unless we swap the outlet heads out. Also, this is the code, electrical code. Outlets are a certain height. Good. There's a. So, you have to be careful of the height. Yes. Looks like there's an army medal on the. Yes. Yes. Yeah, based on glasses. There's at least two or three other key things. The logo on the hat. Yes, perfect. You guys look at that, and it turns out it's a local logo. What that means? It's local in Colorado. It's a regional. Yeah, exactly. Then there's. I can't see the barcode on the snacks, but you can see the snacks themselves. I can see the barcode. They're exactly. And that can potentially tell you the brand and then the and so on, as well as potential allergies and reactions. They're up. Well, this, yeah, I mean, this is a broader subject. I mean, some other years, I don't, I mean, me and my wife or whatever on vacation, while we're on vacation, I don't post a damn thing. I don't want people knowing that. Right Okay, and one more thing that you might take out. This is a subtle one. So, in the corner at the bottom right, you see a moving box, right? Or a box of some sort. If you go back to the reflection that you saw earlier, if you keep looking past the face in the top corner, you see a whole row of empty shelves. Empty shelves plus moving box means that someone is either moving in or moving out. Right? Yes. Is that mouse pad on the left? That's a good question. Yeah. So maybe they're left handed. That's on the right side. Yeah. It's on the left side. Yeah. Yeah. Paper shredder, guys? Sorry? You the paper shredder? Yeah. Okay. So, again, so we just spread through and there's a dozen things right there we found. Yeah. Well, just looking at the seemingly innocuous photo. Okay, and just to wrap up, the key takeaways from our top of the road. Yeah. 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 You would call that out, man. You would call that out. Of course, I'm playing my Sorry. So, the takeaway that I'm entitled to end is the data center. The data that you leave may be non obvious. Okay? In other words, do not trust yourself to always be cognizant of which factors may potentially be used against you. The most dangerous. Those factors are the ones that you may not be needed to okay? And that leads us to be our, not just the technical but the metadata, the environmental, the location, the like wall size, the brand, and so on. And also, the end of the world, the images may be complicated, in particular social networks, and so on. And then finally, at the end of the note, Silver Robert Zero once told us Roman is if there's ever any doubt, there is no doubt. Okay, and that means that if you're ever in a situation where you have a Critical photograph, if you're not sure if it's safe to post it or not, then just go. Thank you.